All right, so good morning, everybody. So picking up from where we left off in the last lecture, um, so we were talking about implementing methods for your class. Right? So if you have a non-static method, that's a method that's, used, uh, that's called using an object reference. Okay? Uh, we looked at some ex simple examples of methods, uh, and those methods, they change the state of a point. Right? So they change either the x or the y coordinate of a point, or perhaps both. Uh, methods that change the state of an object, these are called mutator methods. Right? And methods that don't change the state of the object, but instead return information about the state of the object, uh, those are called accessor methods. Right? Some methods, um, what's the best way to describe this? Some methods don't really seem to do either. Right? So they don't change the state of the object, but they don't necessarily return information about the object either. And so th those types of methods don't have a special name. Right? So an example of an accessor method is if you've got a point and the fields are private, uh, the users of the point, they can't get to the x or y coordinate of the point. So you probably have to provide a method that lets them see what the x and y coordinate are. Right? So you can write a method that returns the x or y coordinate of the point, right? and it's very simple in this case. Right? So if you want a method that returns the x coordinate, you just return this dot x, right? or just x would be fine in this case. Right? Similarly, if you want a method that returns the y coordinate of the point, just return this dot y. And away you go. Right? So accessor methods tend to be easier to implement uh, than uh, mutator methods. Okay, so uh, when you write your method, you have to pay some attention to um, how you actually declare the method. Right? And so the first line of the method declaration, sorry, method declaration uh, doesn't have a standard name. Sometimes you'll see the name method header. Right? And so that's where you write public something, 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 something. Right? And so the header is made up of, uh, of, of the following parts. Right? So there's the modifiers, there's a return type, there's a name, there's the parameter list, uh, and then occasionally you will see a method uh, that says it throws something. Right? Um, so let's take a look at an example of a method, uh, one of the method headers uh, for a method that we implemented in the last class. Right? So here's the set method. Right? Uh, the thing, the uh, header always begins with whatever modifiers the method has. Uh, the, st the conventional order is access modifier, whether or not the method is static or not. Uh, and then there are some other modifiers that you can use, but we don't talk about them in this course. They don't really have any uh, application for our purposes. So the keyword public is what's called a modifier, right? In this case, it's an access modifier. Right? That's typically followed by the return type. So our set method returns a reference to a point two object. Right? Uh, if your method returns nothing, you return uh, the return type is void. Right? Next up is the method name. And then there's round brackets followed by the list of parameters. Right? The order of the parameters is important here. Right? Uh, whatever order you specify the parameters in, when someone calls the method, they have to call the method matching the order of the, uh, passing in arguments that match the order of your parameters. Okay, so the good morning. The parameter list is stuff inside the round brackets, right? Basically, these are the variables that are local to the method, right? So the variables x and y, these are usable inside the body of the method. Right? Now the rule is, these are variables that are local to the method, so, right? So they have to the names of the the names of the variables have to be unique, right? No, so that so X and Y here, they can't both have the same name. Right? Now, if you have other methods in the class, right, they can have the same names X and Y. Right? That would be fine. Uh, notice that, uh, so this example, I think in the previous slides, this was new X and new Y. Right? The parameter names can also match the field names. Right? So all that's important here is that the names of the parameters for, the, for this particular method be unique for this method. Okay, and finally, there's something called the signature of the method. Uh, and so the signature of the method is actually very important here. So the signature of the method consists of the method name, uh, followed by the types in the parameter list. Right? The names in the parameter list are irrelevant as far as the signature is concerned. Right? So for our method set, it has two parameters X, uh, that are uh, whose types are double and double. Right? And so the signature of the method is, so the name of the method, round brackets, this type here, 
So double and this type here, double. Right? So the set method here has the signature set double, double. Here are a bunch more examples. Right? So these are all methods from the string class. Right? So the method to uppercase, its signature is just to uppercase. Right? The method car at that has an uh, one int parameter is just car at int. Right? Index of is index of string int. Right? And then get cars is get cars int int array of car int. Right? So the signature name of the method, uh, the types of the parameters in the order in which they were declared. Right? Now why is the signature important? Because inside a class, the signature uh, of your methods must be unique. Right? And so you can have uh, as many methods as you want having the same name, right? but their parameter lists, the types must be different or in a different order. Right? So for example, uh, we had methods x and y that let you change the x and y coordinates. The reason they're not called set right, is because if I have one method set that changes the x coordinate, right, I can't have a second method set that just changes the y coordinate right? because their, uh, their signatures will be set double. Right, and then set double. Right, so you ha now have two methods that have the same signature, which is not allowed. Right, the way that the, uh, so when you call a method, the way that Java figures out what method you want to call is that it looks at the signature of the method in the class uh, where the method that you're calling uh, lives. Right, so if you're calling a point two method, it's gonna look in the point two class and look at all the signatures of the method and try to match up the method call to the matching signature. So in Java, it's very common that you have two methods in the same class with the same name, right? And so uh, this is true of most object-oriented programming languages, right? Or most of the common object-oriented programming languages, right? So if you have two methods with the same name in the same class, we say that the methods are overloaded, right? Now you have to be careful with this word because there's another, uh, there's another term that's commonly used. Um, there's another term that that's uh, overridden, which means something completely different, right? So an overloaded method uh, is just a method that has the same name as another method in the class, right? So for example, I went in the point two class, uh, one useful operation uh, is to calculate the distance from one point to another point. Right? So you might want the distance to another point whose X and Y coordinates are given by two float values. Or you might want the distance to another point whose x and y coordinates are given by two double values, right? And finally, you might want the distance to another point uh, that's given by a reference to a point two object, right? And so those are all examples of overloaded methods, right? Three different distance to methods. They can all exist in the same class because their signatures right, are different. Okay, so that's the, uh, so the, the idea of a method signature um, is important in the Java language because that's the way that uh, Java figures out which method you're gonna call and whether or not you're allowed to include another method into the class, right? As long as it has a different signature, you can add that method to the class. Uh, and finally, there's the return, well, not, I guess not finally, um, but there's also the return type. So all Java methods return either nothing, in which case you have to say it returns void, right? or it returns a single type of value. Right? Uh, and I think I mentioned this earlier in the course, um, the fact that a Java method can only return one value uh, is occasionally inconvenient. Right? Python lets you return a tuple of values, right? so as many values as you want, uh, which is often nice. Uh, in Java, you're stuck returning a single uh, type of value. Right, so the method x, that returns a double value, right? Uh, and also remember, if a method says it returns a value, there has to be a return statement in the method that actually returns um, a value of that type. Yeah, question at the back. A global variable, um, in, sorry, in what sense? Oh, so this is not a variable, this is a method that's inside the point two class. Right, so as long as the point two class is visible, right, then this method is also visible. 
So uh, it's not really the same as a global variable. OK, so the next um, thing I need to talk about is uh, that in Java, uh, you can have methods in classes uh, that are actually common to all other classes in Java. Right? And so the way this works in Java is somewhere there is this class called big O object. Right? It lives in the package java.lang. Right? Now, we haven't talked about inheritance yet in the course. Um, so it turns out that in Java, every other reference type inherits from this class called object. Right now, we're going to talk about inheritance later in the course. Um, for now, what you need to know is that if something inherits from another class, uh, that means it gets all of the public methods that are in that other class. Right? And so all other reference types inherit from Java, uh, sorry, <laughs> inherit from object. And so that means every public method that's an object, your, uh, the other, uh, all other classes also have those methods. Right? And so there's a method called toString, there's a method called equals, uh, and you'll see this method called hash code. Um, so these are the three methods that are important to us. Right? Even if your class does not define toString or equals or hash code, right, your class ends up getting a version of those methods anyway. Right? Now what this lets you, what, what this provides the Java language is uh, that for any object, right, for any object reference, you can call toString on that reference. Right? For any object reference, you can call equals on that reference. And for any uh, object reference, you can call hash code on that reference. Right? And so we know that, uh, so our point two class that we've been making, it has a toString method even though we haven't created one yet. Right? It has an equals method even though we haven't created one yet. Right? Oh, actually, let me, uh, let me show you this in the clip. So here's uh, point two. I've just added in the methods that we talked about in the last class, right? So here's set x, y, x, and y, right? OK, so notice there is no two string, right? But inside my main method, or anywhere else, right, I can do uh, string s equals t dot two string. And that works, right? So the Eclipse is perfectly happy with it, right? There's no error. If you want to, you can print out the string. So system.out.println uh, s. Right? And again, again, Eclipse is perfectly happy with that. Right? So as far as Eclipse is concerned, this is valid code. Now, this looks weird because we haven't defined two string yet. Right? You get it because our, whoa, sorry, because our class point two, right, it actually inherits from uh, the class java.lang.object. And that class says that there's a two-string method. OK, so this compiles, but if you run it, you get something strange. Right? You get this funny uh, output here. Right? You get the, whoops, whoops, the name of the class, right? followed by an at symbol, followed by some sequence of numbers and letters. Right? Exactly what that is, it doesn't matter. Right? You get something. Right? So the method call works. Um, it probably doesn't produce the output that you're hoping for. Oh, similarly, you can do the same thing with equals. Right? So I can write something like uh, p dot equals t, like that. Right? I want to test our p. Uh, I want to test are these two points. Uh, well, probably what you want to test is are these two points do they have the same coordinates? Right? So let's try that, and this prints out true. That's good, right? P should always equal P, right? Something should always be equal to itself. I have another point Q here, though, right? So is P equal to Q? Right? That's going to say false, right? And you say, well, that makes sense, right? Q has coordinates 0, 0. P has coordinates. It looks like 2 minus 2.5. So of course, they're not equals. That's actually not what's going on. If I comment out that line of code, right? P and Q both have coordinates 0, 0, but equals is going to say false, right? which looks confusing. But I'm going to explain this uh, probably in the, uh, probably not in the next lecture, but probably in the lecture after. Right? So the point is, you've got these other methods that you haven't put into your class yet. 
because the class java.lang.object says those methods must be there. Right? Okay, so what is toString supposed to do? So toString should return a textual representation of your object. Right? Not every class provides toString because it doesn't make sense to always print out an object. Right? There are objects where it doesn't make sense to print it out. But for a point, right, you might want to print out a point so that it looks something like a mathematician's point. So you might want round brackets, maybe square, right, braces, something else. Right? The coordinates of the point, perhaps separated with a comma or something else, right, whatever you want. Right? But it would be nice to be able to print out points right, if only for the uh, to help you debug. Right, so you're debugging your program, your point has the coordinates that are unexpected, you might want to print out the point to see what they actually are, right, instead of going through the debugger. Right. So it'd be nice if we could actually print out a point. Right, and so you can go ahead and add a toString method to your class, right, and when you add your toString method, uh, that will replace the one that you inherited from big O object. Did I tell you what it looks like? No. Okay. So if you want to put in a toString method in your class, right, toString is always public, it always returns a string, its name is always toString spelt exactly like that, and there's nothing inside the round brackets. Right? Ignore this right now. Right? So this is supposed to return a textual representation of your object, so your job here in this method is to produce the string that corresponds to this point. Right? I would like the string to be round bracket and round bracket at the end. So I'm going to return a string that starts with a round bracket and ends with a round bracket. Right? In between, I would like the x coordinate followed by a comma, followed by a space, followed by the y coordinate. So that's easy to do. Right? Take your round bracket, concatenate the x coordinates, right? concatenate a comma and a space, concatenate the y coordinate and then concatenate the, round, uh, the closing round bracket. And away you go. So let's try that out. Right, so I'm gonna put in a public string to string. Right, I'm going to return and oops, oops, round bracket plus this.x plus comma space plus uh, the y coordinate plus the closing round, uh, parenthesis semicolon at the end. Right, like that. Okay, let me print out the string down here again. So P S, because we're P called to string already. Right? And now when I print out the point, aha, uh -huh, right, we've got a point that looks like uh, something uh, that's a lot more readable than what we compared to what we had before. Right? Now the uh, magic out with print line is that you don't have to call to string. So System dot out print oh yeah, yeah, yeah. print line. I can just print the point S. Uh, sorry, I can just print the point T instead. So can I just print T? Right? So you try that, you run that, and the answer is yes. You can just print T. Right? And so this is uh, one of the nice things in Java. You don't have to call to you almost never have to call to string manually, right? If you want to print something out. Just print out the thing. Just print out the uh, object. Right? Print out the reference, um, and the print line method will magically call to string for you. Right? And so somewhere there, in uh, if you go and look at the documentation for whatever class corresponds to out, right? You'll see that there's a version of print line that takes in a big O object. Right? So it turns out you can pass any reference to that method. Right? Inside that method, all it does is call the method toString for you. So I need a web browser. Right? So Java, blah, 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 blah. what do I want looking for? I'm looking for OK, so I'm going to go to the system class. I'm going to look for this method. Oh, wait, I'm going to look for out, which is right here. Right? And I'm going to look for the method uh, print, println. Okay, so let's look at println. Right, so notice that it's overloaded. Right, there's many versions of println in this class. Right, there's one that takes in nothing, so that just prints a blank line. 
There's one that takes in the Boolean, one that takes in the car. You'll notice that there's one that takes in um, every primitive type. Right? So print line, if you call it with a double, right, it knows to call that version of the method. Right? And that version of the method knows how to print out a double value. Right, right there, right, there's a method that takes in a big O object. Right? Now because every class in Java inherits some big O object, right, if you have an ob if you have any little O object, you can pass it to this method. Inside this method, all it does is it calls x.toString and then prints the string using that version of the method. Right? So there's a version of the method that actually takes in a string. Right? And so when you just print out p, right, that calls that version of the method. Right? This version of the method calls toString for you and then calls that version of the method which prints out the resulting string. Right? So you almost never have to you almost never have to call toString on your own. Um, the reason it's there, right? The reason that you it's there and you may want to consider redefining it is so that this magic happens here. Right? So that when you pass it to that version of the method, um, you actually get a nice string rep uh, you actually get a nice readable representation of your object. OK, so there is something else on that slide. Oops. There's this funny at override here. Right? Notice that in my code here, there is no at override. Right? And so uh, the at override is optional. If you put it in, then your compiler is going to check, is your method header actually correct? Right? So in other words, is there really a method in the class big O object that is public, returns a string, it's called to string, sorry, and has no parameters, right? If there is, then the compiler is happy, right? So at override works just fine, right? Nothing, it indicates, that, uh, there's no indication that there's a problem here. Now, if you decide to change something, so, or if you incorrectly declare to string, so for example, if I change the big S to a little s, right, then what the at override, tag, uh, at override tag does is it forces the compiler to check, right? Is there a method called in big O object? And the answer is no, there isn't, right? And so it, it's there to indicate to the programmer that you're trying to override a method, you're trying to replace an existing method, but that method doesn't already exist. So change the big S back to capital, sorry, change the little S back to a capital S, everything's fine, right? Suppose you, so a common error that students will make is that they will write uh, two string like this, right? They think they have to pass in a point, um, and you don't, right? So if you try to write that, and you have the at override tag, at override tag here, right? The compiler checks whether or not there's such a method in big O object, and it says no, there isn't. Right? And now it tells you, hey, this method that you're trying to um, override, um, that doesn't exist. Right? Now, you might ask, why is this important? Right? So remember what the rule is in Java. You can put whatever method you want into your class as long as its signature is unique. Right? So if I comment out the at override tag, right? I change to string to to little at string. Right? Now notice there's no error. As far as the compiler is concerned, this is a per perfectly legitimate method, right? However, when I run the program now, right, and I print out the string, I don't get the expected output, right? I get, I end up getting back the uh, gibberish that I got before um, when I didn't override to string, right? So what's going on now? Well, now you've got a method called to little s string. You also have a method to big s string that came from objects, right? So this at, override tag, this at override tag is an optional feature uh, that forces the compiler to check whether or not you are correctly, uh, whether or not you're overriding a method that actually exists, right? Doesn't have to be there, um, 
But if you put it there, the compiler will do a little bit of error checking for you. Right? And that's what this thing in red is trying to tell you. OK, so by providing a toString method, that lets users of the class easily print out strings, uh, easily print out points. Right? If you didn't provide this method, every time you wanted to print out a point, you would have to write some code that got the x coordinate, got the y coordinate, and printed out the point that way. Yeah. Yeah, so, whoops, whoops. Right, so let's try to put in some method that we know for sure is not in object, right? So public uh, int some method, right? That method almost certainly does not exist in big O object, right? And uh, um, turn zero, right? If you try to put in at override here, right, you get an error, right? Hover over the error, it says the method some method must override or implement a super type method, uh, which is the compiler's way of telling you, hey, there is no method in big O object called some method. Okay, so there's a little example of printing out a string. I think I even do the, oh, I don't tell you how to, okay, uh, which I did in it. All right, so let's go back to the counter class. Right. So again, remember, we're implementing methods. Right. So if I have a counter, remember the counter is this thing, it just counts from zero up to some, uh, up to integer max value in increments of one. Right. So if I'm using this class, I probably want to get the current, I probably want to get the current count, right? Whatever value the counter is currently at. Right. I probably want to advance the counter by one. Right. And it would be nice if I could print out the value of the counter. Right. So I want to provide two string as well. Okay, so remember our counter class? All it has is an int value inside, right? So this value is always between zero and int max, integer max value. Right. So how do I get the current value of the counter? Well, I just provide a method that's public, right? It returns an int. I'm calling it value. You could call it something else. You call it get value or something like that, right? All you do is return the value of the field, this dot value. Right. If you wanted to, you could just return value. That would be fine as well. Right. Notice that the field name, sorry, yeah, the field name and the method name, uh, they can be the same. There's no issue with that. Right. Okay. What about advance? Now, the counter class, remember, is funny. Right. It counts from zero up to integer max value, uh, and then it. Uh, sorry, I think if uh, the the documentation is not here, but up here, if the documentation was here. Right? It would say that if you're at integer max value and you advance the counter one more time, it goes back to zero. Right? And so we need a little bit of logic in our method to make sure that it goes back to zero if you happen to be at integer max value. Right? Okay, so our method advance increments the value of the counter by one. If the method is called when the current value of the counter is already max value, then the value of this counter is set to zero. Right? So the counter wraps around back to zero. Now remember how ints work in Java, right? If you add one to integer max value, it becomes integer min value, right? The most negative int value, right? So I can't just use plain old arithmetic here. I actually need an if statement. Right? So if the current value of the counter is not max value, go ahead and add one, right? If it's not max value, I know that for sure I can safely add one and the result will be the correct mathematical result. Right? No overflow will occur. If this if statement's not true, I know that I'm at integer max value. Right? And so now I have to set this value equal to zero. What you cannot do here, right? you cannot write this value plus plus, right? and then say if this value is greater than your max, right? set it to zero. Right? That is a surprisingly common mistake um, that uh, newer programmers will, new programmers will make, right? If you're going to compare value to integer max value, right? Value can never be bigger than max value, right? Logically, that doesn't make sense, right? Integer max value, that is the largest possible int value, right? So this value can never be bigger than max value, right? So you never want to compare an int to max value using greater than, right? Logically, it doesn't make sense, right? Mathematically, it does. Right? But you have to remember, this is uh, programming. It's not the same as math. Right? 
the limitations of the primitive type is that that has an absolute that has a maximum value, which happens to be that. So that can never be bigger than that, right? If you do, if you write this value greater than integer max value, that condition will never be true. Right? So be a little bit careful when you're comparing things to max value or min value. Okay, what about two? So for two string, we need to decide what should the string representation of a counter look like. Now, when you do this, it's up to you, right? So it's up to the programmer to, de to figure, to define what should my string look like, right? So you could choose many different things here, right? You could just use square brackets and then the count. You could use round brackets in the count, uh, braces in the count, angled brackets in the count. You could write a little string like count, colon space, followed by the count, right? Whatever you want, it's up to you, right? Whatever you decide, you have to document it up here, right? So that other people know what should they expect when they call two strings, right? And so here uh, we say that the string is simply the string count colon space followed by the current value of the counter, right? And that's easy to implement, right? It's the string count colon space followed by the value of the counter, right? So none of those methods are terribly hard to implement, right? Uh, this one's a little bit tricky. You have to be a little bit careful when you do the, your logic. Uh, value is trivial, right? Many of your accessor methods will often be just one line. Okay, stopwatch is a little bit more complicated. For the stopwatch class, it's this thing that simulates or is supposed to represent a physical stopwatch, right? Start the watch, stop the watch, look at the watch, see how much time has elapsed. Right. Okay, so if you remember from the previous lecture, Right, the way you implement this class is that you have a start time, so that's the time when you, the user presses start. Right, you have a stop time, so that's the time at which the user pressed stop. Right, and you have this field called is running, which is true if the user has pressed start, but they haven't pressed stop yet. Right, as soon as they press stop, is running becomes false. Right, so you know that the watch has stopped. These times are in nanoseconds, right, so 10 to the minus 9 seconds. Uh, no one wants to read, well, most people don't want to read nanoseconds, they want to read seconds. So I need to convert nanoseconds to seconds. So I'm going to declare a field called billion that I can multiply the time by to get to seconds. Right, it's private so that no one else can see this field. Uh, it's final, so no one can change that value of this field. Right, it's static, so there's only one copy of the field in the entire class. So that's what the static keyword means if you put it in front of a field, right? So static in front of a field means that there's one copy of the field billion, right? And that field lives inside the class, right? If you take away the keyword static, what you're saying is every object has its own copy of one billion, right? That's wasteful, right? The field is final, so that value can never change. Right, so it doesn't make sense to put this number into every stopwatch object, right? You only need it once, right? And so your, uh, one of the things you can do in Java is make the field static, right? And now that field billion, it belongs to the class stopwatch, right? It doesn't belong to each individual stopwatch object, right? And so that saves you a little bit of memory. Okay, so. I need a method that starts the stopwatch, right? So if the stopwatch is already running, there's nothing to do, right? It's already running, so you don't have to start it again. So as long as the watch is not running, right, I now need to set the start time of the watch, right? And so remember from the previous lecture, we're gonna use nano time to do that, right? If you don't remember what nano time does, this is the most uh, precise time available to your computer, right? It's gonna be different for every computer, right? Every operating system, every computer architecture will have a different, uh, is able to resolve time uh, to a different uh, value, uh, to a different smallest value, right? So we're gonna use nano time to get the time, and then you set is running to true. And that's it, that's all you have to do. Okay, well now what, when you stop the watch, right? Uh, if the watch is already running, right, then stopping the watch 
you just simply need to set the stop time. Right? So again, you just call nano time to get the current time and set the stop time to that value. Right? You stop the watch, so is running is now false. Right? Now stop's a bit unusual the way I've defined the method. Right? So when the user presses, uh, or when, you, when the user stops the watch, right, the watch tells you, or tells the user, uh, how much time has elapsed. Right? Stop the watch, and now it tells you five seconds has elapsed uh, since you pressed start. Right? So I need to return the amount of time that has elapsed since uh, uh, since start was uh, was pressed. Right? So instead of doing the calculation here, I'm going to call another method. Right? So I'm going to call this method called elapsed. And elapsed is the method that returns the amount of time that has elapsed. OK. So inside elapsed, right, there's two times that are, there's two different kinds of time that are relevant, right? So the amount of time that has elapsed is the amount of time since the user pressed start, right? If the watch is still running, then that's the amount of time that it should return, right? If the watch is not running, then you don't want to return the amount of time that has elapsed since you pressed start, right? You want to pass, you want to return the amount of time between start and stop. So the way this works is, I'm going to get the current time. I'm just going to call nano time to do that. Right? If the watch is not running, right, then I want the time between stop time and start time. So now I replace current time with the stop time. Right? And now the calculation is the same regardless of which situation we're in. Right? It's just the current time minus the start time divided by a billion. Right? Notice that the current time is a long, right? So long minus a long divided by a long, right? That all gets done in long arithmetic, which is probably not what you want, right? You probably want to do this in floating point arithmetic. So I need to force the current time to be a floating point value at 0, 0.0 to the, at the very beginning, right? So that's a double plus a long. That becomes a double minus a long. That's a double divided by a long, which is a double. Right, so that guarantees that the calculation is done correctly in floating point arithmetic. Right? If that 0.0 is not there, and you don't do something with the current time uh, to turn it into a double, uh, this calculation will uh, use some form of integer arithmetic, right? which you probably don't want in this case. All right, uh, so there is the uh, introduction to simple methods in uh, Java. Okay. Uh, any questions so far about writing a method? They basic, it's basically like writing a function in uh, Python. The main difference here is that inside of a method, inside of a non-static method, you get access to the fields of the object, right? Uh, and that's normally uh, uh, what you want to do, right? Most methods are going to access the information in the fields, right? Um, if you want to do so, the method is probably non-static. OK, I now want to go back and look at uh, constructors again. So, so far, we've implemented no argument constructors. Right? Remember what the job of the no argument constructor is? It sets the state of an object to some well-defined default state. Okay. So just like methods, you can have multiple constructors in your class. Right? And again, just like methods, the signatures of the constructors must be unique. Right? Now, your constructors, they all have the same name. Right? It's the name of the class. Therefore, if you want multiple constructors, the constructors must all have different parameter lists. Right? Now, why do you want multiple constructors? Because people who are using your class, they probably want to initialize their object. Uh, it's, often, it's often the case they want to initialize their object to some state that they want to define. Right? So if you're using a point class, um, in many cases, you know what the coordinates of the point are. Right? So you'd like to make a point having those coordinates. Right? You don't want 0, 0 all the time. Right? I want to set the point to 1 and minus 5, for example. Okay? So to make it nice for your users to use the class, just provide an extra constructor. Okay? So here's our point 2 class. It's got two fields, x and y. Right? Now there's another. There's a, I've added a second constructor that takes in two double values, right? one for x, one for y. Right? Now notice here, I've done something that looks strange. Right? 
I've got a parameter called x, I've got a parameter called y, I have a field x, I have a field y. This is not a problem in Java. This is perfectly acceptable. Right? So you can, have two param you can have parameters that have the same name as the field. Right? Now your problem is, if I want to refer to that field x, right, I now also have a parameter called x. Right? And so the question is, is, what is the value of x inside of the method? Right? And it turns out the value of x inside the method is the name of the parameter. Right? So let's go to Eclipse and put in this constructor. Right now, remember for the no argument constructor, I said that you can just write x equals 0 and y equals 0, and everything's fine. Right? So if you write that, then the, uh, the compiler knows, oh, you mean the field x, and you mean the field y. If I add that second uh, constructor in now, so double x, double y. Right? Now, if I never told you about this, right, what you might think you would write is x equals x and y equals y, right? Those two statements do absolutely nothing. And Eclipse even tries to warn you. You probably can't see it because it's very faint, right? So if you hover over it, though, there's a little orange line under it. And it says, the assignment to variable x has no effect, right? The statement x equals x does nothing, right? You're taking a variable, and you're assigning the value of the variable to itself. Right? That does nothing. Right? So inside the method, the name x always refers to the parameter. Right? So the parameter always has precedence over the field inside of a method. If you want to access the field name, now you must write this in front of it. Right? So in this case, I want to set the field x to the parameter x. And I want to set the field y to the parameter y, right? And that is why the keyword this exists in the language, right? It's to disambiguate cases like that, right? You might want to ask, why does the language do this? Why, don't you, why doesn't the language just force you to use a different parameter name here? And the answer is, is because it doesn't. <laughs> That's the answer, right? So uh, if you have a method where the parameter name matches the field name, when you want to use the field name, you have to write this in front of it, right? Remember what this means. This is a reference to the object that this constructor is currently initializing, right? Whatever you do, don't write x equals this x, right? So don't write it backwards, right? So x equals this dot x, right? This is also very common even in week 12 of this course for some students, right? Whatever you do, don't write that, right? Remember the thing on the left-hand side of the equal sign? That is the thing that's being assigned to, right? I don't want to assign a value to the parameter, right? I want to replace the value of the field, right? X equals this X takes the value of this dot X and stores it in X, right? It turns out in this case, it's going to store the value 0 in x, right? And then it does nothing, right? This x is still 0, right? It's not equal to x, right? So don't write it backwards, right? Make sure that you write it the correct way. Right. Uh, this is actually one of the reasons why. Um, so there used to be uh, languages that were designed primarily for teaching purposes. Uh, you may have heard of them. So there's a language called Pascal. Uh, there's a language called Turing. They didn't have an equals operator, right? Because this thing here is a bit confusing, right? It kind of looks like the mathematical equals operator, right? Uh, and so they would use a different operator. They'd use something like colon equals or something like that, right? Or other languages will use uh, this notation, right? Less than equals, right? That looks like an arrow. Right, which is supposed to suggest that the value of x goes into the value this dot x, uh, the variable this dot x. Right. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't. So it doesn't. Modern programming languages no longer do that. 
Um, there were well, that's not true. Uh, Pyth la languages like Python and Java, they don't do that anymore, right? So they don't use that, uh, they don't use a special operator for the uh, assignment operator. They just use the equal sign. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing. Programmers tend to, programmers just learn um, eventually uh, exactly what this assignment means. Right, so if you are looking at the slides, right, those lines there explain exactly what this.x uh, and x mean inside of this method. It turns out this is quite common inside Java classes. Right? So it's quite common that you have uh, parameters that are named the same as the field. Oh, this is explaining what's happening here. Okay, so when I call this constructor, right, passing in these two values, right, remember what all this does, right? It makes a point, it makes a variable p somewhere in memory. Mu allocates memory for the point two object. So somewhere in memory, a point two object appears. Right? The object appears and it gets the copies of all the non-static fields belonging to the class. Right? So this point object has its own x and y. Right? That constructor gets called. Right? Now when you call that constructor, so there's your constructor down here, right? The constructor gets the address of the object being created, right? And it stores that in this, right? If we go back to the slide here, right? This constructor has two parameters, x and y. So there's a parameter x and there's a parameter y in this method, in this constructor, right? The value minus one gets written into x. The value 1.5 gets written into y. Right, and so this is the information that the constructor has, right? The constructor now runs, right? So whatever code is inside the constructor, it now executes, right? So inside the constructor, there's this dot x gets the value of x, right? So this dot x gets the value of x, right? So the minus one gets copied into here. This dot y, so this up here, dot y right here, gets the value y, which is here. Right, so the 1.5 gets written into there, like that. Right, and now the constructor's done running, new finish is running, returns the address of the object back to the caller, and the address gets copied into here. Right, and so notice that there's two different x's here, right? There's the x that belongs to the object, there's the x that belongs to the constructor, right? Okay, so inside the constructor, there's parameters with the same names as the field, right? When this occurs, the parameter has precedence over the field, right? Sorry, I think I'm over time. If you're reading online, you might see this term shadows, right? So inside this method, we say that the parameter shadows the field, right? That parameter x hides the field x. That parameter y hides the field y, right? If shadowing occurs, you need to write this dot x and this dot y to get to the field. All right, so I think that's it for today. Uh, and we'll finish off that lecture um, on Friday.